But I want to introduce you to uh, Alain Bosse, otherwise known as the Kilted Chef. Hi, and, everybody. And uh, yeah, there he goes. He just wants to talk right away. You can see him, eh? He's eager to get going. Um, Alain and I have been working together for a long time, and it's always a lot of fun. And when, uh, when he told me what he was doing, I think it was back in March or April, and I, I tuned in, I was like, he was just trying to have fun and stay connected with his audience. And man, has this thing ever grown. And uh, for those of you who haven't been following him, he's got over 45,000 followers now uh, on his uh, Facebook uh, show. Uh, he's got incredible sponsorship pieces that he's built. And like all of us, you know, he, uh, got impacted mightily when COVID hit. And, you know, it was, you know, that opportunity to sort of rethink, all right, how am I going to stay connected with my audience? How can I do that in a way that is still true to my brand and my purpose of what I want to do as far as food and the culinary uh, side of things, uh, connect it with the stories of, of my own personal journey. Uh, I think it's been just an incredible uh, thing to to be part of and we had him in Newfoundland actually in the fall to do a series of live shows and uh, it was it was a great learning experience and as I said with this digital media it's a it's a great way to level the playing field for many of us in this sort of small operator field who don't have massive marketing budgets but can use these tools to get in front of very large audiences whereas you know not too long ago you needed to spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to get in front of people uh, at this level. So without further ado, Alain, I'm going to throw it over to you as we're going through. Um, if you do have questions or anything, uh, throw them in the chat room or raise your hand. Uh, I think we're going to learn a little bit uh, as we go along here because we had talked about let's do it as a cooking show. So I'm going to spotlight you, my friend, and it's all yours. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Always a pleasure to work with uh, GMS and your team. Uh, guys, a lot of you guys are familiar with the Kilted Chef. A lot of you guys are good friends. A lot of you guys don't have a clue who I am. So let's start from the start. Uh, my name is, uh, I, I'm usually better known as the Kilted Chef, but right now I'm Alain cooking without a kilt. And uh, that's that is a challenge that we all have, guys. I mean, at uh, let's face it, first couple of weeks when the pandemic hit, both my wife and I, Joanne, sat on the couch in pajamas, same as everybody else, and binge watch uh, The Lion, what's, what the, what was that? <laughs> Netflix, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. And then after a week, it was just like, okay, well, I can't do this. I'm just too uh, much of a person that needs to be around people, and that's really, really affecting me. So we started to think of how were we going to survive this? Uh, we went from 360, crazy busy, full out, traveling the world, going all over the place, doing all kinds of funky, fun stuff to absolutely zero business. Uh, yep, basically next to nothing. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are in the same boat. So instead of sitting back and uh, moping about it, we decided to get up and do something fun. So we started doing this really crazy show. And the way we thought we'd set up this morning's session is set it up as if we're live doing our show, okay? So basically we're gonna walk you through some of the pains that we went through at the beginning. And live with me is Joanne on the right. She's on the second, on the laptop. and. On the chat room, you can ask any question you want, and she'll tell me right away, same as what we do on the show, and uh, back and forth. So just so you know, we're live now, officially. So we're going to introduce the show as we usually introduce it. And so therefore, therefore, my name is Adem Bosse, better known as the Kilted Chef, and you're here cooking live without a kilt. We haven't worn a kilt unless we've gone to special occasion like Newfoundland. We were in, we were in Gross Morn and uh, in the park and everywhere we did some different shows but we've been diversifying our shows in different ways and growing as we go so here's the really humble start of this and the reason we did this 
was honestly to give our friends and our family a chance to be exposed to cooking and maybe uh, do something fun. So the first step that we did is, okay, we're gonna go live. We're not quite sure how to do this. So we did a lot of this. Uh, Are we on yet? Is it working? No, no, I don't think they're there. You know, you know, so on and so forth. We did that at the beginning and we did that probably for the first four or five shows and realized that we needed to improve. So we kept improving, but here's how the show started. My cell phone, a roll of duct tape, three recipe books, because two wasn't high enough, and a step ladder. Yep. And we put it right there on the left hand side of the kitchen, and it was zooming in towards me this way. And every four or five minutes, we'd have to go back and prop the foam back off because the, the tape would make the foam flop or so on and so forth. So that's really where it all started. And we started doing recipes that we love and we're still doing recipes that we love so as of now just to give you a little bit of what this would look like uh the show itself on average has anywhere between 150 and 300 people live for a full 45 minutes 35 minutes or an hour depending on what we're cooking um constantly asking questions on average um, anywhere between 500 and a thousand comments back and forth uh, and they're from likes and shares and so on. So if you have a chance, just go to our Facebook page and see how we took the chance to pivot. So then we started associating ourselves with as many things as we did. So we, we did a trip on the South Shore. We did a trip in the, the Parsboro Eastern Shore area. We did a trip to Newfoundland. We did, so we're not only cooking in our kitchen, we're also going to different places and making it part of it as we started growing. So the real reality of the show was all fun and games till it turned into a little bit more of a business. And I think that's what you guys were looking for. How do I, how do I pivot? How do I turn this around? And I have to tell you that since we started back in March, almost a year, we have done a total of 342 recipes. We've done 200, and today is 240th show every single day. So we've committed to this and we did every single day till we got till July, till the sun got a little better. Then we said, okay, we can't keep up doing this because we're gonna burn ourselves. So we decided to then take Saturdays and Sundays off. So Monday to Friday succeeded after that. And this is where we're at today. Our statistics and demographics at this point vary, but our demographic is from 35 years old to 70 years old and up sometimes. Depends, depends. If, and what we've created is a sense of a community with the show that Martha, who is in British Columbia, is watching with her daughter that is in Nova Scotia in a private chat room and they're going back and forth. Oh, I like this, I did. And then they go live in a Zoom talk and do the recipe themselves at nighttime and do whichever. Like we've really created a sense of uh, community. Uh, like this week, for example, one of our viewer, which we hadn't seen for a little bit, just popped up, uh, you know, and uh, she said, well, guys, I'm so glad to be back. And then she proceeds to tell us our story that she got COVID and she's now recovered and things are great. So it's really created a community. So then we said, well, how can we turn this into a business? And then we started looking at the numbers. So once we started looking at the numbers, we knew what the demographic was and we knew 60% was female, 40% was male, which was very interesting. Uh, so now we had to align ourselves with all this. So we started, we did a show uh, for the fun of it on, we started doing our summer barbecue shows and so on. So there's been a lot of fun things that's taken place over the, over the show. Well, this is what happened as an example. We did a show the first time outside on the barbecue. I'm not seeing questions, by the way. I know you're, you're listening very attentively, but you gotta keep. You gotta ask questions. You gotta. You gotta participate here. You gotta give as much as you're getting here. Okay, so it's very important. This show, we're all set up outside. It's beautiful. 
I turn the barbecue on, I lift the cover, all of a sudden the cover, live, mind you, the cover of the barbecue slants back a little bit and leans on the rail of the patio. And I'm going like, oh, I'm in trouble here. So I gen gingerly, gingerly started scraping the barbecue to put the meat on and all of a sudden the whole cover of the barbecue dropped right on the floor right at the bottom and then made this big huge noise and we didn't miss a beat i just turned around and started chopping something else and we went back to it and about while the meat was cooking i decided to take the, the barbecue cover with my hands and start wrestling it to put it back on you know so we wouldn't burn the patio and of course there's 125 pound cover cast that you're trying to cover go like this back and forth and of course it doesn't stick so i decided to throw it over the over the patio so it would burn the grass not the patio the next day we had a brand new sponsorship from a barbecue company called warmth by design out of onslow nova scotia and that's when the light went on and said okay maybe there's some more merit to this that there is so then we'd start digging deeper into the uh, into the stats and here are the stats as of this morning as of this morning We've touched, that's eyeballs to the show, since we started the show, over 10.2 million viewers. Yep, so that is pretty phenomenal. Uh, on average, uh, it's about 300,000 or so per month, give or take, uh, and uh, it's pretty cool. So success was there in the show, and therefore, when we started going on the road, it helps those little businesses. There's a little business on the Eastern shore uh, that we did an actual show in that literally went from really 20% of their business back to their normal, especially with takeout and everything else, because people forget that they're there. We've got to support. We understand that we have to support local. We understand we have to support everybody that's going on. But we went to, and the next story is we went to a little, um, a little canteen slash uh, haddock shack in the middle of nowhere in the South Shore. And the, the eyeballs to the show on that one was over 100,000. And all we did was a captain's platter, fish and chip type, right there into, into the little store. It was really cool. So lots of success to the show, all right? So I'm going to start cooking while we're doing I see questions of finally decide, finally decide to type something, finally. Wondering how your time management adjusted to this new digital dimension and the time consumed versus your paid time. Uh, well, to be honest with you, uh, this is a lot more consuming time than you would expect. Uh, it's just a 45 minutes to an hour show, but at the end of the day, setting it up, getting it ready, getting the ingredients, planning the menu for the week, making sure everything is lined up and ready to go is a commitment of at least three to four hours per day of just the show itself. That's not marketing yourself and doing everything else. We have spent so far that you know how you could do buys on Facebook and buys on Instagram and whatever else. We're very, very proud of this part. We have sent, spent so far zero dollar of our own money in promoting this show. It's all been word of mouth and consistency. Is there been many times at the beginning where we said, we don't want to do this anymore. This is too hard. This is this. Yep. There's no question. We, there's a couple of times we weren't making the money with the show and we're not making huge money with the show, but we're surviving with the show. And that's the key. And we, we now charge per show. Uh, we charge for endorsements. We charge, you could buy, we've, we've seen how different it is. So you could buy spots where, you're sponsoring the prize for the week, like Duck Sun Limited is doing this week. Um, you could buy a, we now have our mail out, people that registered to our mail out newsletter is now at 2,553 as of this morning and growing. Uh, we, as a result of the show, have spinned off a bunch of other stuff. One thing is we've launched our first ever product. We've never endorsed the product or had a product before. So now we have hot under the kill Cajun, the Canadian Cajun seasoning. And it's, we thought we, uh, we'll sell 200 of these. That'll be fun. People will buy it as novelty. 
we've just hit this morning close to 1,800 bottles sold already, and we launched in November. So things are happening for us, which is, if you would have asked me, hey, chef, what's your marketing plan a year ago? And the answer would have been, do you, like the question was, are you part of social media? Yes, of course, I post on Facebook, I post on Instagram. But do you, you know, if somebody would have asked me, do you have a plan of turning your business into social media like we are doing now? The answer would have been never in a million years. Yes, Joe? Can you go into a little more detail about how you monetize the show? Uh, we'll get to the monetization of the show as we go a little further. If that's okay with you guys, I want to make sure you understand the flow of this. So as a result, let's get cooking here while we're doing this, while we're still chatting. Um, the, the show itself is now, uh, has developed a few things. One is our e-commerce. So our e-commerce and uh, is one way of monetizing. And what we did is we associated ourselves with some local artists as much as we could. So we have, for example, the spatulas that are there. They're the Kilty Chef spatulas. They have a nice logo. They're made out of New Brunswick white birch. And it's an artist out of Bakerbrook, New Brunswick. And his name is Luc Seal and Paula Lance. And uh, they, they decided, like we decided to do these for us to do shows throughout the world years ago. But we only ordered a dozen or so every so often. We, as a result of our involvement of our new e-commerce, e we're now in the midst of, in, of branding the next series. And that is jumping into the 400 since Christmas. So that gives you an idea of the power of e-commerce. Another one is uh, out of Deer Lake, Newfoundland. So we've teamed up with Juniper Scrapers. And now they're doing Viking boards. And we've added our logo to the board. We've sold over 60 of these boards so far. The next one is out of uh, Tatamagush, Nova Scotia. Tanamagush, Nova Scotia is a salt pig. Nobody knows what a salt pig was. A lot of people didn't. So we educated them about the product. We used it on the show. Then all of a sudden we started making salt pigs and we've sold over 60 of these. So that is one avenue of monetizing it. The next one is the eBooks. So we've decided, did you have a question there, Jeff? Okay, so what we decided to do, because this was getting so popular, people were saying, you know, we'd love to get the recipe. We'd like to get it in our hands and so on. It's hard to search. It is hard to search on Facebook for the recipes and so on. And we sit on the couch every night, Joanne and I, and answer as many as the, as the, question, the, the questions that come in or comments that come in, you know, after the show, people watching after the show. Because there's, there is, uh, let's say, 250 or so watching every day. But there's thousands and thousands of people watching in a rerun later on through the night. So the, when we post the show, we get on average, let's say that once we post the show, later on through that night, we post the recipe. So between those two, that's two posts per day, and it gets on average 35 to 45,000 hits every day. So there is some people out there that's, that's uh, obviously following this. And our audience, which we thought was just our friends at the beginning and people locally, our audience currently right now is literally all across Canada, 75% is Canadian. And out of the 75%, out of that 75%, a good 80% is from Atlantic Canada, 20% is from across Canada. Then we have the U.S. demographic and we have also the European demographic that watches us at night. It's kind of cool. It's cool because we are using products they don't know about, right? It's all about promoting Atlantic Canadian products. Let's go back to the book. Yep, oh, yep I'm coming back. <laughs> I'm a little faster than you guys are. Sorry, I'm, I got so much exciting things to tell you guys. So you got to give me a chance. So the ebook itself, in the meantime, the first ingredient in what we're making, we're making a, an Italian style bruschetta, by the way, something that you could do uh, to entertain this weekend fairly easy, especially with the Super Bowl coming up. Who's a Brady fan, by the way? All the haters. I'm not a hater. I'm a fan. All right. And so the ebook, what we've decided to do, this was a, a 
you're, we've got so many learning curves it's like this, right? So our first, what happened is we got our ebook, put it in place. We got it designed by a gentleman. Oh, Joanne's printed a copy. Thanks, Joanne. So that is number one ebook that we printed. Okay. Each book has the since we started the show. So this started on March, April, and May is volume one. And then June, July, August is volume two, and it's coming out in on Valentine's Day. And then volume three will follow the next three months, and volume four will follow the last four months. So that'll be a complete year of the show. Once it's all done, we will print a hard copy of the entire series and we'll sell it. And then we will donate X amount of money to charity. And everybody's well aware of this. So that's our plan right now. But in the meantime, if you want to buy the ebook, you could buy the ebooks on our page, on our e commerce. So we said, well, you know, what do we sell an ebook for? You know, it's difficult. I mean, we ended up, that was a big argument internally. What are we going to sell? You, you know, it's worth money. I mean, these recipes are all original recipes and so on. So the ebook went on sale at, un, to my dismay, went for about $12.95. Everybody else on the team wanted to sell it for 10 bucks. I wanted 25 bucks. Uh, you know, that kind of argument. And uh, But at the end of the day, $12.95 worked. And we sold enough to cover our costs and just about it. So we said, well, how do we do book two, three, and four, do all this work for what little revenue that it's going to bring us? So we had to reinvent it. So what we did is we turned around and sold advertisement in the ebook. And shh, you're not allowed to say this, but on February the 12th, is it 12th or the 14th? Valentine's Day. So the 14th, Valentine's Day, we will gift every one of our viewers, a free ebook number two, and so on and so forth. So they'll end up getting the copy free. So that's how you evolve. But then we made our money by covering our costs and making a little bit of money for us by selling advertisement in it that is related to the show. For example, Logan's Daily Catch, who's been sponsoring shows throughout, who are one of our major sponsors, well, they will have a double page spread. They will have a logo on each recipe throughout the book that relates to what they sell. Great form of advertisement will last forever and it will get in people's hands. We estimate between the newsletter and everything else that's going on, we will, and because every advertiser is allowed to share this to increase our newsletter, they'll have to sign up to get a free copy. Uh, therefore, then we'll have a captive audience on the newsletter as well. Uh, and we estimate we're going to hit close to 10,000 copies even out. So that will increase our viewership even more. So that's the story of the ebook for now. Any other question on ebook? All right. So my tomatoes have been sliced in half and they're put in. And we do this during the show too, by the way, where Joanne and I will be bantering back and forth. And I know the South Shore girls are being quiet right now, but I know you guys watch once in a while. We see you guys watching. And it was such a pleasure to spend a, a, a good week in your area and exposing the, the South Shore. What they decided to do is because we're all trying to do something different, they wanted to expose the restaurant that don't necessarily get the coverage usually, not the usual suspect, you know, White Point, Quarter Deck, et cetera, et cetera. So we went to four or three or four different restaurants that doesn't get the exposure. Another cool things that we did too is do us uh, in Yarmouth and Acadian Shore area, we did a big, huge campaign uh, about takeout. And the reason why is because they wanted to be able to have footage for takeout into when the second wave would hit. But we did a competition for the best takeout in the area. It was really, really cool. But more importantly, what took place is it brought to our, the Kilted Chef's bigger picture, new sponsorships and being able to sell the show. And I think that's the meat of this. Now, this none of this would have happened if you are too, like basically what's selling for us and what's working 
is we're being ourselves, guys. We really, really are. This is there, there's no secrets here. We we will everybody knows that we have a new puppy. Everybody knows that uh, you know, Joanne has an appointment or whatever, or Al's getting his hair done, or you know, they notice everything because we've curated a community. So you've got to be able to open this part up and be yourself, or else it's not gonna work. Susie is just pointing out that the show that was at that event was having a head of shock and that his barber was great and the owner did see a significant rise in business. And Jackie's wondering, uh, she said she knows there's a team of two for the show, but how many people are part of the virtual classes? How many in our team? The two. <laughs> no, sorry. There's a total of three people on our team. Uh, everybody's at a distance. So it's Joy and I, and we also have our sous chef, Lisa. That's really, that's the core team. That's who does pretty well everything. Uh, and at a distance, we have a marketing uh, group called Dashboard Living, uh, Sarah and Brent. Uh, they do their own little live show, but they also do a big, uh, a lot of work with uh, corporate people, which is, they, they have us as a client, as an example. Uh, they do a fantastic job. And I think without them, we wouldn't have been able to pivot to the point where we're at today. So here's some example. Uh, we've always had great sponsors. Country Magic out of the Valley is a sponsor of the Gilded Chef. And we've been involved with them for years uh, and so on and so forth. Nova Seafood, Bill Logan's Daily Catch, all regulars. Uh, but since, since, and the Wild Blueberry Association of Nova Scotia is also, those would be our three anchors. And uh, so since then, we've picked up uh, our first multinational. We haven't really come out and said much about it yet, but we picked up a national sponsorship uh, and it started January 1st, and that is Subaru Canada. So Subaru Canada has come on board for us. We'll end up doing some shows in the dealerships. We'll be doing special events for them and so on and so forth. So we're not losing sight of the Kilted Chef brand because that's super important, but we're also creating this type of stuff. And Subaru Canada is a new sponsor. So is Warmth by Design. And we now are negotiating with two others. So it gives you some ideas of how this all came about as a result of getting more exposure. Lots of exposures to the Kilted Chef around the world, but not necessarily as much in our own backyard. Yes, awesome, awesome uh, partnership that we've had with Saltscape Magazine as the food editor, celebrating our 13th year, by the way. Uh, that we've been writing for the magazine. Uh, we also have a great relationship with Food and Beverage Atlantic and Taste Nova Scotia. Um, Food and Beverage Atlantic, of course, sponsors the CTV shows. We're now on the, believe it or not, we're now starting our season three, which is year three. Yeah. Maybe we could talk about how major companies also have to pivot and how they can use shows and platforms to our fans here. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, basically, Ben's Canada, Ben's Bakery has been sold to Dempster's. Dempster's now owns Ben's Bakery. And therefore, they wanted to pivot in Atlantic Canada in a way that merging the two and starting to talk about it. So they decided to do this big, huge contest with us. First, they did a, a live show. They could buy, anybody can buy a live show and be with us and we can promote their product as long as it's done tastefully and not with big billboards and whatever else. And therefore, they we did a Ben's uh, couple shows to promote their summer bun. Uh, it's called, a, it was a golden bun that they brought out this summer and, uh, or in, in the early in the spring. They, they sent back feedback to us that it was the best single, you no, said, the best rollout event in Atlantic Canada they've ever had and they've done it through the show only it was great and people are still raving talking about their buns and most people are out now freezers and tea so we need to come back back so as a result of that doing so well we picked up a literally a larger contract where we did a recipe contest on the show and the winner of and it had to include either English muffins or Ben's bread and the recipe and the, we got a total of 386 recipes entered. Uh, we had to sort through all that, pick the top 10. We made the top 10. 
And then we picked the top six. And then we did Monday was number five. Uh, Tuesday was, uh, was, you know, and on and on and right up. And we did a special Saturday show with the grand champion and everybody got all kinds of prizes and all kinds of stuff. So the good part of being small, you could pivot to do all kinds of this type of stuff. I mean, I can't wait for the point where the provinces start getting involved to doing some of these things. I mean, we're we're originally from New Brunswick. I'm originally from Edmonston, New Brunswick. So therefore we touched, that's why we, we, we self-proclaim myself as being as the Atlantic Canada food ambassador because Saltscape Magazine touches four provinces, of course, and CTV touches four provinces, of course. And we are from New Brunswick, or I am from New Brunswick. We work very closely with PEI, with the Shellfish Festival. We're in Newfoundland with GNS very well connecting and having great fun there. And of course, we live in Nova Scotia. So, and we've been in Nova Scotia longer than New Brunswick, mind you, but it's still part of it, right? Leah, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, one of the things and one of the reasons we brought you to Newfoundland in the fall was there was this sort of thirst for the visitor, the audience to, to become engaged with, um, with the destination, um, to learn a little bit more about, you know, what we do, you know, for, as an example, in Grossmore and some of our artisans, some of our, our facilities, what, what have you learned and what could you share with folks about, I guess, that thirst from the audience side to stay connected? And I think one of the key things that I want to drive home for folks <laughs> is that uh, the food is sort of the medium. It's never really the main focus. And when we had a land over, we had some crazy sessions on the go. And, you know, it, it was at the end of it, you realized you had this thing that you cooked, but you didn't even realize you were cooking about it because you were learning about the history of this person's family or you were learning about how this art was made. I think that's been one of the key pieces for your show and, and what you've done with it. But I, I'm just, I think, you know, staying authentic to who you are, but also highlighting intriguing pieces about the destination or about the place that you reside uh, is key to keeping that audience engaged. I, I agree, John. Thanks for, thanks for bringing me back on track here. Uh, basically, guys, what happens is it's not about the show it's about what we feature often and if you look at the shows we did at Newfoundland we teamed it up with an artist at every corner so we would have lots of content to talk about but the food that we did was very traditional baked beans uh you know scrunchions and uh, and the list goes on and then we touched on moose we touched on halibut we touched on all kinds of stuff that people were interested in but they were more interested in the fact that they had never been to that part of the world and wanted to be exposed and learn more about the folks and the people that are there and the actual, uh, it was more important than the recipe itself. There's no question about that. But if you look at the artist, I mean, look at Hervé, when we did the live show at Hervé's, her website e-commerce just went crazy afterwards and started selling all kinds of products. So for me, it's really about exposing as many people as we can to Atlantic Canada and making it work. Break down to as much local product as possible as well. That's I, the key. I think that, that was really key of, of how we, when you do this, and I love how you've mentioned about the partnerships that you've created to be able to sort of, you know, nobody's gonna get rich off, off of this, um, no. you know. But you can you can make a living. You can grow your audience, and you know when things do get to the point where you know we're emerging out of this this mess. I think the fact that you're able to stay in front of your your consumer in a positive way um, has a a really major impact. So when they want to come back and they want to go to your cooking classes, or they want to uh, see you at one of these festivals or events. Um, you know, your profile, your image is still there. It's still prominent uh, to the consumer. And you're absolutely right. The, the spinoffs that we had with those artisans was insane. 
and we did this in a in a glass shop and people were uh, online trying to buy when we panned around the glass shop uh, there was this clothesline piece and she sold the whole section of that out and then there was another artisan that Alain connected who is an incredible um, a painter with the juniper uh, charcuterie boards so they've actually created a partnership now out of this where she's doing these uh paintings on the charcuterie boards um which is just incredible so i think it's you know staying true but thinking about what your audience wants like i think alan you've done an awesome job with that is that you know a lot of it's been comfort food a lot of it's been things that you can get your hands on it's not about um sort well, of putting, putting airs on so to speak it's it's staying i think no. real I think the, the part of the show that very early beginning, Jonathan, that we put was, it's all about cooking what you have in your own pantry. And a lot of people were always very intimidated by those types of stories, right? But what we, the success of the show as well, this is all very important. The other part too was the purpose of the show was really to give people something different than watching the news and being so scared. It was a way for people to just chill out for an hour and just get away from the world. The amount of com the, 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 the motivation for us was exactly that. The amount of comments from the people saying, you know what, I wouldn't have made it without you. I really appreciated that three o'clock buzzer. I set my time to it. I still watch that work in hint, et cetera, et cetera. And, and for us, that's the motivator and uh, being able to, to do that part. So what I want to do is recap the recipe quickly and then ask, let's open this wide up to all kinds of questions, guys. We can talk about all kinds of stuff that will blue in the face, but it's, let's talk about what is the challenge for you and how can we help to make a difference? So I've got about two cups of tomatoes. I got a half a red onion. I've got about 24 black Kalmata olives that I deep reseeded. I've squeezed so far one lime just to let it all sit. And I'm doing an Italian version, so I'm using some fresh basil. I'm going to use a little bit of hot under the kilt seasoning inside and sea salt. And then I'm going to finish that bruschetta, bake it in the oven with all kinds of green air on top, and that'll be finished on this amazing charcuterie board that I have in front of me. In the meantime, let's open this wide up. Any questions you have, Joanne? How much time do we spend daily? Uh, we answer the questions in the show live, right on the spot. So basically, exactly like we're doing now, as we're cooking, people will have a question. They'll type their question. Joanne will ask the question, and I'll answer it right away. We cover about 90% of the questions. They come fast and furious, but Joanne is getting to the point now where we're not missing much, are we? And then we review it back. Like we threw out the show. Guys, if we miss your questions, please ask, ask your question again. And we get to cover about 90% of it during the show live itself. Can you talk about how we partner with Um we, we <laughs> that was a big jump for us because we've done our company for the last 15 years pretty well solo on our own. I think the biggest hardest part for us of doing that was to let go of certain things. Um knowing that there's somebody else there that can answer the odd questions uh, and so on and so forth. But it, what it did for us, and it was very important, we wanted to make sure that whoever we worked with was people we could associate it with that had the same core values and so on and so forth. So it took us a long time. Uh, but when I knew Sarah and Brent for a long, or like probably the last four or five years, as a, as a, people that we would do business with, but only, you know, in passing, uh, but never, and I never really understood what this whole influencer part was about. And they more or less educated us to the influencer. And they're still now when they sell the show or they talk to people, they often say, you can't tell Ali's an influencer. He, does, he doesn't get it. <laughs> and it's true. For me, it's not about being an influencer. It's about educating people on how to use something that they may not know how to use. There is no secret in our kitchen, and that's what's made this so successful. Yeah. If you could go back, um, 
Did I answer that marketing question for you? Okay. Did you go back to day one? You were telling me you did a different job. I changed what? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Poor Joanne. Were you going to say Joanne? <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. So uh, to be honest with you, uh, the only thing I would do is probably, uh, I'm back and forth on that. I, my original plan was, was saying maybe at the beginning, we probably shouldn't have promised as much because we've committed ourselves. Uh, so it's not as flexible. So if we're if we have to shoot our CTV segments, we have to do a couple of reruns. And now people are used to that and they get it. Uh, but that part would have been difficult. And if it was something I would have done differently is I would have educated myself on how to put this whole show together. Technically before doing the ladder with the duct tape. So that would be step number one. Why did you choose to do the show live? Because it's real. If it was pre-recorded, you would not, uh, you would expect it to look a little bit like Food Network and you're too fancy and you're trying to, uh, you're, you're trying to sell us something, et cetera, et cetera. By doing it live, it's impromptu and things happen and it's super fun. For example, uh, not, not about a month ago, I was doing a roast a one pot roast. And in order to do that, I had to reduce the caramelize the onions and the apples and everything that I had in this. And I thought I had it in a cast iron pan and I put it on my bird and I kept producing, talking to people, having a good time. All of a sudden, right in the middle of the show, boom, there was onions everywhere and so on and so forth. And that's why the show has been successful. And I think also we get Yeah. I should be brave enough to attempt this. See, we're trying to educate people of the, of the fact that it's cooking is not all about Food Network. It's all, when you look at the Food Network, often a lot of the things that are being put together are not, not necessarily totally real. So this brings that aspect of being normal. Rory had a great uh, a great uh, question. I don't know if anybody wants to unmute and, and share, but is is anybody out there, um, you know, thinking about diversifying what they have done in the past and using sort of a combination of this virtual digital uh, component piece to connect with their audience? Anybody doing that now or thinking about doing it? Uh, Trina, you said that you uh, were thinking. What, what's your what's your uh, piece that you're going to do, Trina? Um, we, I guess, Alain kind of alluded to something that we looked at doing as well. Mom used to work at the Ocean View Hotel, and now retired. I have her as my sidekick. <laughs> so where we do the backcountry tours, we want to try to do some live stuff where we're back actually doing it. Uh, showing the area, explain our stories, talk about the business, and actually do those kinds of things in the wild so that people can come with us and experience that part of it. Um, we're just trying to figure out how, how to monetize it, really, because, I mean, if we can put it out there, we can promote it, but how do you actually get somebody to buy into it? How do you actually make a living off of it. I haven't quite figured that out yet. <laughs> but I mean, we've got our ideas in place, what we want to do. We have a great area here that we want to bring out the basics. Um, you know, so many artists like Alan said he was here and, and talked to different people, but we want to show the other things like go and talk to the fishermen, see how they split the fish and, and, and do more one-on-ones um, -on with locals so that we can bring the interest here so when people come back here there these things are here that they can do I'm, I'm finding we're getting lost because people aren't actually coming to the area right one of the things is anybody doing this right now because one of the things we've talked about in, in using sort of this virtual now it wouldn't be live it would be sort of recorded pieces but is being able to capture experiences so let's just use the gross morn example of, of people um, in an experience, but demonstrating the safety precautions, so the social distancing, what we're doing, but also trying to demonstrate how you're still having fun with it. 
So it's putting that audience sort of at ease. Um, you know, at this point, we're very much focused on provincial markets. And I think, you know, as we think through all of these things, the reality is, is that, you know, we may be lucky to get the Atlantic bubble back. Um, but the reality is we'll probably be looking at a lot of provincial uh, market again this summer. But just, I think, putting them at ease of we've taken all of the, the sort of thought process out of this, like we're going to make your safety priority number one, um, as well, giving you an incredible experience. So using some of this uh, sort of media component pieces, I think allows you to capture some of that video versus what we've learned is putting it in written format. Nobody reads any of that crap. Like they want to actually see how they're going to experience um, you know, what they're going to do, whether it's in the South Shore of Nova Scotia or in Northern New Brunswick, but in a, in a way that's going to be safe, but fun. Anybody doing any of that right now? I, I think, I think Jonathan, one thing is to say is starting a brand new type of adventure business in the middle of a pandemic is kudos to you. Uh, but I think a quick advice for that would be to start showing video wise what and social media wise what this could look like and given the experiences and so on that people can have building your audience till it's time in a very COVID manner safe and so on will make a huge difference at the beginning and i think that's the approach that i would use so go ahead joe So Joanna has got a good point. I mean, people are super hungry to travel uh, and uh, therefore are sitting home and are quite happy to do this virtually just to give them some enticement of wanting to go. As an example, the amount of people that are watching our show that watched us while we were at Gross Morn that now has Gross Morn on their bucket list as a very important place for them to go visit as a result of the show is huge. And we could see that by visiting Gross Morn uh, Facebook, the amount of people that registered to the Facebook through the show is uh, was very good uptake, Jonathan, during the week that we were there and a couple weeks after of people that are just dying to want to do something different, right? Oh, for so sure. I, I think it's very important. I think we picked up, I mean, we had, we ran a Facebook competition, which got hacked. Talk about digital media, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, but we had, I think, over 100,000 people uh, apply for that that uh, sort of free trip that we had on there. And right. I think it increased our, our, I think we got an extra 8,000 people um, that connected into our, our Facebook grouping from that. So you know, I think it's, I think it's key. Is anybody else out there doing anything? What about you guys in Sackville? Are you guys doing any of this stuff with the with the town, with the region? So while you're thinking about that, I'll recap the recipe, Jonathan, if you don't mind. I've got brusque, I've got uh, literally uh, some uh, some baguette that I sliced and did oil, olive oil and sea salt, and I've finished my bruschetta itself, and that's what I'll put on the actual board to go into the oven. That's what I'm working on. If you're watching in the background, go ahead. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I don't know if uh, if Matt's going to reply too, but uh, we're doing um, uh, uh, like a cooking, actually a cooking show <laughs> with one of our employees who is uh, filming things and then we're putting it out on our social media. It's quite popular, um, but I'm not aware of anybody even in the town and certainly we're not um, doing anything to sort of monetize any of this stuff or even to directly... Uh, promote any of our local businesses, which we definitely should be doing. So it's something to really put into the into our, our, our list of things to kind of explore more. One of the ones that I saw, we had uh, some of you were on with Kim Doyle, who's the the uh, sort of you know incredible festivals and events lady with the the Cavendish Beach Festival. Um, you know, and she talked about how they use the the sort of virtual shows. Um, you know, it's been interesting to see how some of those festivals and events have done that. I think the struggle has been the, the monetization. I think that's the always the the hard side of it in, in many ways. I mean, Elaine, you already had a profile and we're, and we're well known. 
uh, around. John, here's here's an aspect that pe that people forget is no, but none of those all the big companies right now have got huge marketing budgets that are not being spent. They're not spending their marketing dollars because they don't know how to do it. So this is where we made the difference. This is the clincher, guys. We went to those companies that have money and showed them the way of how they can do an increasement. And that's how we got Subaru, for example. We showed them how all these people are going to buy a car and they need to know a little bit more a car. And now we're talking about Subaru on our show. People associate to that and it works. So it's uh, it could be as simple as the pharmacy down the street in uh, in Sackville uh, would usually spend X amount of money on newspaper and this and this and that. They're not spending that money right now. Maybe they would spend that money on sponsoring that little cooking show that you have brought to you by so-and-so pharmacy or the insurance company or, you know, like all these people are looking for a way to be able to communicate to the market. And therefore, you have to go after them. You have to think outside of that normal everyday regular advertisers yeah. you're, you're absolutely right alan and I'll, I'll go back to this and i think we have some some dmo folks on here um even if i look at our own budget um we haven't spent hardly anything on marketing and promotion you know and we don't have a massive budget you know a couple hundred thousand dollars but uh that's why i guess we chose to try to use your show as that reach out to potential audience and engagement. Oh, I got all excited there, Jonathan. I thought you were coming up and saying <laughs> half page in the ebook from the next three ebooks. I get all excited there. What's See, you're always on? trying. You're always trying to sell here. See, he's 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 got us hooked on his hot under the kilt sauce, and now he's trying to get me to to sponsor one of his pages in his ebook. Um, John, Joanne brought a good point. Uh, basically. Here's how we got to that point where people start paying a little more attention to us. We started small by doing a weekly prize into our show where for this week you could enter, you, the way you enter to win is you had to comment and you had to like, or you had to, you know, press one of the emojis. But the idea is we started very small. I think the first prize was a cookbook. The second prize was a cutting board. The third prize was... It eventually got to, we gave an amazing trip to the same shore when we did that whole week promotion. We did an amazing prize when we did Newfoundland uh, section. We did the same thing on the Eastern shore and so on and so forth. And that's how we grew our audience to be able to be seen by people that has advertisement money that can now start spending it on our show. So that's the key. You've got to give back first and create a way to be able to educate those people to say, hey, we're here and we're talking to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, Ron says technical aspects can be challenging. It seems like people are setting this up for higher end production values, but we are not there. Uh, yeah, that, Ron, that's a good point. But at the end of the day, people are, re are, are engaging more to the real what's going on than to the pre registered or pre taped shows, to be very honest with you. I mean, uh, the, the, when we do our craziness and bantering and back and forth and it's live and people are watching it afterwards, they're engaging and so on, that seemed to have worked for us. Does, maybe that's not what you're thinking that might work. But at the end of the day, if you're going to do it pre-tape, it better be professional and very high end because they're not going to watch it. So therefore, you're spending all this money to get that done versus doing it live and accepting the fact that you might make the odd mistake and therefore be a little more affordable to do. I guess for us, that's what it was. So what Joanne said is basically uh, the audience became very engaged to watch what ingredient am I going to leave on the table by the time the recipe is finished that I will have forgotten. Or they also laugh at my measurements because I'll say a teaspoon, but it's an al teaspoon. It's a, probably a teaspoon and a half or a teaspoon and a quarter or a two teaspoon. So people are used to that now. And that's what they come for. For us, that was that's part of the success. I'm adding gruyere to this and I'm gonna pop this in the oven, guys. 
and I've got basil. My God, this is going to be a great breakfast. I don't know if you guys are hungry, but come on up. Any other question? Our setup now is, uh, as we have right now, we have two lights uh, that shines onto the product and one on the ceiling to give us better lighting. Uh, the other thing is we had a back window that we had to put a screen on. Uh, we have a tarp on it so that uh, it doesn't reflect back uh, and therefore making the whole show white. We have a proper tripod and we have a directional holder for the cell phone at the top. That way it sits perfectly. Uh, and we have our two phones hooked up as well that we answer questions with. So that is it for us. Uh, and if we do a live show, we could, like we were at Bremel Hill Farms last week, we went right into the farm, set up our tripod, and we checked our speed. The one thing that you have to be careful of is make sure you do speed tests everywhere. That's the key. Uh, the, the speed test has to be your upload, not your download. Download is when you're downloading um, your documents and so on and so forth. That's always fairly high, but your upload is what makes the difference. You need a minimum of 10 or, or sorry, you need a minimum of eight, six to eight upload in order to have a successful show. Otherwise, you're spinning, constantly buffering while the show is going on. So just an FYI. Anybody else? We've got some time. Are we past our time? Are we okay? No, nope, nope, we're still we're good. Finished? We're still good. I think, you know, I mean, uh, I love the fact that you you do do your piece as, as a live show. And I love the the fact that, you know, we burnt the crap out of something on the open fire or people were actually emailing us, is that guy on fire when the, when the juices, you know, went onto his arm yeah, yeah. and, and, you know, I think those are all good, but also for everyone else, I, you know, I think you should be thinking about how do I, you know, the beautiful thing that we have at our disposal now are these cell phones that, you know, can record in 4k um, can after, actually capture good audio component pieces. And how do, we, how do we use those devices today to capture engaging content that has meaning to your audience? And I think that's the key piece. Yeah. And what Alain has done well, and, and, you know, and to Joanne and him are, are perfect at this, is they bring all of these stories uh, into play. I think that's the, the key piece. Nobody wants to just um, hear you standing in front of a, a camera talking about, you know, you know, the history of this or the history of that. They love to hear about why it has meaning to you so that they can relate to it and understand why it would have meaning to them and why they should come to your business, to your destination to, to have these types of experiences. And that's a difficult one. It's almost like, uh, you know, becoming a storyteller. And, you know, I know that Lori had to jump off of, of, of the call here, but it's been phenomenal, the conversations mm -hmm. that I've had with her mm -hmm. and lots of other people about how we've actually improved our storytelling capabilities through this whole mess of, we've had to be so much more concise. We've had to actually, uh, you know, take it down because, Let's be honest, you got somebody, you know, Alan's lucky he can keep somebody for 35 or 40 minutes. The rest of us, you know, we've got 25 or 30 seconds on that digital sort of medium to engage someone. What does that look like? Um, what is it that we're trying to do? What is our purpose? What is our mandate? You know, we have to be true to that. And, you know, I think that's the hard one. What I will say is that don't be afraid to, to make mistakes, just get yourself out there. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be, you know, this whole polished thing. If you look at it, like TikTok has upset the apple cart and people are experiencing destinations, not from polished $2 million ad campaigns. They're, you know, they're basically experiencing it from people doing these 15 second little video uploads. So how do we, you know, we can shake our, we can either shake our heads at it and, you know, and say, oh, nobody's watching that stuff. Or how do we use it and use our own creative talents to, to tap into that? 
And as I said, when we started, I find it's leveled the playing field. You know, we don't need million dollar budgets any longer. And how do we, but how do we get ourselves out there in this crowded market? So it's in front of like any of you that have done this, you don't, don't load something up on, you know, you might get lucky, load something up on YouTube and all of a sudden it's a, uh, you know, being, you know, completely uh, swamped with millions of, of eyeballs. So it takes time, it takes effort, it takes energy, um, you know, and Alan, as, as he said, it's, it's taken a lot of effort to get this in front of people. So I, I think Jonathan, one of the key things to the success to the show is also the engagement of the public. You know, the more you engage them, the more they are involved. And, but you got to watch the subject. Like for us, we, we had to be careful because we have a couple of jokers in our audience and they stir the pot where they'll say, she chef, I see you wearing a kilt today for a special occasion because we did, we did a couple shows for the consulate in Miami live on our show being broadcast throughout Miami to all the, the, uh, the, uh, the expats. Uh, and we've done that twice so far. We've done one for New Year's and we did one for Canada Day. Uh, and therefore I'd put the kilt on and one of the audience members said, well, Chef, well, what do you have under the kilt? And that prompted uh, like 30, 40, 50, 60 comments about what Al's wearing on the kilt. But I want to make sure I touch on a couple success things and a couple mistakes that we've made that you guys will, will appreciate. Uh, as you go forward. So one mistake that we've done is we no longer say that we love something in particular in the show. So for example, Al said, I was using one of my mother's tea dish towel. You know, the, the type that you wash with, this type that you wash the, the counter with and so on. My mother hand knitted those. I don't know if I'm, all you guys can relate to this. And I was down to my last one. I'm cherishing it. It's got holes. It's got whatever. And I said to the show, I said, oh, my God, I'm going to miss this. I said, my mother did this. It was the last thing that she did for me. And I still had one. And the next week, four, what, four packages, four different packages from four different areas of, of the Atlantic Canada loaded with dish towels for Al so that he would do it. And at the beginning, Joanne started, because she wanted to keep herself occupied, she started a Pyrex um, collection for the fun of it. And uh, I'm not going to show it to you, but there's over, I would say, over 100 pieces of Pyrex that we now have. And it's fair to say that a good 25 to 30 percent of those were dropped on the front deck from some of our viewers saying, here, I really appreciate what you guys do. There's a gift from us. And it's their Pyrex that they got when they got married or got as a gift or whatever. It was very personal, but you've got to be careful from that perspective, okay? Because they will, you also have to start to keep in your identity a little quiet because as this grows for you, um, it, it, does, it does take its toll. That's right. And, and you, a good question earlier about the marketing aspect of things. And, and one of the things we did earlier in the show that was very important to me was name, drop name brands, right? I'd say, oh, today we're using Hellman's mayonnaise and we're doing uh, mustard from Atlantic, uh, PEI mustard, and I'm using ADL cheese and so on. And if you keep dropping names like that, and you keep showing the brands, they will stop. They will not buy the show, right? So it took some time at the beginning for my marketing team to say, you've got to stop talking about ABC brand because when we go to sell the show to them, oh, he's doing it anyway. Why should I sponsor the show? So you got to be careful. There's a lot of, of gaps. But here's a, a success story that I want to share with you guys that blew my mind away, okay? So we decided in December that we were going to do curated boxes. So in the curated boxes would be a surprise box that we would put for sale and we would do 100 of them. And that's it, just for the fun of it. And inside the box, we'll have Kilted Chef swag with products that he might have used on the show or so on and so forth. So we put our first curated box together and it went for sale on Friday 
two weeks ago. Uh, at noon, we put it on the website as there's our curated box. They don't know what's in it, right? The curated box is there. It's $75. And then from there, we said we sent a newsletter to all our newsletters that signed up, that 2,500 that I talked about earlier, and said, okay, the box is officially for sale. We'll talk about it on the show today. And at 3.05, when the show started at 3.01, there was two boxes left. We sold 98 boxes in less than three and a half hours. And of course, once the show started, the other two were gone. So we sold 100 boxes to be shipped everywhere under three hours at $75 a piece. And inside the box has all kinds of cool stuff. There's about a value in the box of about 110 bucks. So, but a lot of it is people that we work with at the show and it's a little piece of them. And like, we've got a special piece of, I can't divulge what's in it because I swore I wouldn't tell just in case. But uh, like, there's a piece of artwork in each box that's unique to their one of a kind and everybody's going to get, and there's only a hundred made. So those types of things are the success story that come afterwards as you go. So now we're going to do the created box every two months, but it'll change theme. It'll change ideas and so on and so forth. And now, like I got a sponsor, not a sponsor, but somebody that wanted to sponsor a couple of shows last week, but they want us to use a particular product that they would like to have incorporated in the box in the future. So it all works. It all works one step at a time. I know there's a question there. Alain, with the with how you're doing your sort of e-commerce, is there any specific program that you're using to 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 do that? Uh, in our case, we had the hindsight uh, about five years ago when we redid our website, Jonathan, to add an e-commerce to it, but it wasn't live. It was just sitting there in case we wanted to do it in the future. Uh, so we used that, fixed it all up, got it all live and running. And when you go to, to the Kilted Chef's webpage, it's under Shop or Chef, and you open it, and it's got all the stuff that we work with, that we sell. Um, that's basically what it is. But there is Shopify out there that's easy to use. We also use a combination of that with Square when we do little events. Joanne? Well, we are doing the boxes ourselves. And uh, yeah, we partner with everybody that's inside the box. But I'm gonna take you on a quick journey. Uh, it's a mess, okay? But the boxes, all the components are done and now we started packing the box. So physically, Joanne and I are packing and wrapping every single box, all right? So I'm not showing you the content, but I'm showing you some of the boxes that are ready, for example, that we did late last night. And th this is how messy our kitchen is. Because we're getting ready to ship the remaining 75 boxes. So that gives you the idea. There is nothing that we've done that we've not done ourselves physically. We literally do every single piece of it. And if we could create um, physically something to go in the box, we probably would have. What? Correct. Yeah, that's a good point, Joanne. Uh, so for us to operate our business when we're full tilt and traveling the world and hotel rooms and expenses and everything, it basically requires another additional huge amount of money. So what we've realized by doing this and not traveling like we did and not having as much expenses and everything, we could live on a lot less. Therefore, we don't need to have this much revenue anymore to still have a comfortable living we're okay here. And therefore, it wasn't about the money. It's about survival and about making sure that we continue to build a brand so that when we come out of this, we'll be that much more apps to sell our cooking classes that we do regularly, invent new ones, maybe we do larger ones. We're doing some virtual cooking classes right now in conjunction with Ducks Unlimited. Uh, we have a live one that's on the 27th of February that we're doing a live cooking show on Zoom where you will receive the ingredients ahead of time and we will cook together, all together. And at the end, Jimmy Flynn's gonna come in and entertain. So it's, it's all about diversifying yourself. So for us, 
there's the kilted chef. We always had all kinds of tentacles and stuff we did. And they were all gone except maybe two or three. And therefore, we had to build new ones. And that's what we're doing now, step by step. Alain, we've got uh, just a few minutes left here. I just want to okay. open it up. Does anybody have want to unmute and ask a question or make a point? Um, I do. Jackie? I just want to thank you. I feel like it's so relatable. So I did all kinds of tasting tours in person until COVID hit. So word of mouth, <laughs> someone wanted to do a wine tasting. We did the same thing. We curated boxes in my basement, my husband, my son. It is a big job. It is the biggest job I think I ever undertook. 130 boxes in less than three weeks for it was for a company that wanted to, it was kind of an incentive thing for their company that they missed out on. So it was all word of mouth. We did a PEI potato experience, but it's all for large groups. Like I only do it for a large group of people. So hearing that you're doing it live for small people, you know, small and kind of free in a sense, but looking for the sponsorship, because I'm trying to look or find a way that I can do it for locals to because there's lots of stories here in, on PEI too right and in mm -hmm. my in my in-person things are always not just about the tasting it's more about experiencing the Deep Roots distillery in Warren Grove while you're tasting his products and seeing his you know his just his still that he's made himself and so thank you for all of your information I feel like I could take this and, and, and apply it to what I'm trying to do right now here, so. Thank you very much for that comment. I mean, we're an open book, guys. We, we, we did not plan this, we did not, we fell into this. But I think the reason we fell into this is because we stayed true to our brand and we did 100% commit. And there, it's, it's not half fastly done, it's very well planned, everything has a function. Now, the part that I'm struggling with is because I'm used to go, go, go. I want it now. Uh, and when you're working with a marketing company and working with a bunch of people, you got to take a little more care of the other people and not press so hard. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're making it work. Joanne's got a good point. Should we not even try sponsorship or a fair bit of money? Then not everybody's got that same kind of product placement, you know, yeah, exactly. I, and I think you, you've got you've got to look first. You got to stand like for us to sell the show right now. One sh one off show is nineteen hundred dollars, guys, in order to get a show, and that's one hour of us talking about your product, literally constantly. But not everybody can afford that, so therefore you don't want to leave money on the table. So you want to make sure that hey. I've got 500 bucks to work with. Can you mention my product in a show? Can you show my product in a show? Yes, the answer is yes. What's the, the question is, what have you got to work with and how can you monetize it so you're not losing it? Because if you don't flex, like make yourself flexible, it's like if you said to me, I want to buy five shows. Well, at five shows, we'll give it to you for a lot less money, right? But that's a guarantee you're doing to us and we're doing to you. So it's about working with your clientele at the same time. That's key, right? And that's understanding as well what's available out there for marketing dollars, you know? I mean, if somebody wants to promote a particular brand that I do not endorse or am not feeling comfortable with, we don't do it. It's important what people are saying That's right. And Joanne's got all kinds of great points here, but one of the points that, that she brings, and I thought it was a natural to what I'm saying, is it's important that the show does not sound like an infomercial or you're trying to sell something to them. All you're trying to do is utilize the product and educate them about the product. Example, the charcuterie board. Nobody would have known about these charcuterie boards unless we connected, Jason and I, while I was in Newfoundland the last time. And subsequently, I've connected him five other clients. So it all works. It all works together. And I've got five gift shops that carry all the line of the Guilty Chef. Everywhere in Nova Scotia, our product is in. It's nowhere is in New Brunswick yet. We're just starting out. Uh, but what's kind of funny, the only place 
And we were laughed about this. Uh, I was talking to Stephanie, I think, and I said to Stephanie, I said, it's kind of funny. I said, we worked so hard with the lobster call. We worked so hard with the South Shore, but nobody in the South Shore wants to carry our spice yet. And we laughed and laughed and laughed, of course. But it's because I've not taken the time to promote the product outside of the show. So yeah, it's endless what you can do. Alea, I want to uh, thank you and Joanne once again. You're always so entertaining to, to listen to. And I think we've learned lots uh, from you on this. It's been incredible. Um, you got a point that you want to make? Uh, I think the biggest point that I want to make is for everybody to stay safe and uh, look after each other. And uh, if you haven't seen the show, it'd be an honor if you guys took some time today and joined us. Uh, Friday shows are always a bit crazy because it's baking day, but this week, uh, today, we are doing a Thai chicken curry, uh, Thai chicken salad, and uh, tomorrow we're doing a lasagna, and on Friday, we're doing a caramel cheesecake brownie. Don't miss out. You should come. If you look at the statistics, if you look at Friday, last week's show, we did a wild blueberry lemon cake. It's just hit 60,000 eyeballs already as of today. Hashtag stay in love. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Alain. And I'm Joanne just... is our new celebrity in the house. And I'm going to introduce you to my little girl. Just as before we go, just so you know, we now have a new addition to our family. And I thought we'd share it with you guys and say hi to Miss Piggy. <laughs> there you go, guys. Thanks.